Well, I was asked and invited to do this session. And I have to say, um, for much of the forum, I feel that I'm suffering from imposter syndrome. But I think of all the things that I've been asked to do this year, this is the one that makes me feel like an utter fraud, coming and speaking to um, a group of theologians. So at one level, thank you for the invitation. But at the other level, I wish you hadn't asked me. <laughs> um, so um, I feel um, an imposter. I'm not a theologian. I'm basically a pastor and a church planter, an organization leader, who probably reads mid-level theology and benefits from it. That's kind of where I'm coming from. So um, I want to reassure you, I, my aim today is not to tell you how to do your job. I don't want to do that, and I hope that nothing that I suggest would kind of give the impression that that's what I'm trying to do. Um, if you want to understand what I think my session is, um, I think my goal is to try to give you some customer feedback to your guild from um, the churches that you serve. So take this as it is. It's customer feedback from a user, and um, you're to take that away and think about whether there's anything in it and anything to learn from it. So that, I think, is probably what I'm doing. And I'm grateful that you want that, um, but please receive it as, as it is and judge it um, for yourself. Now, I'm not a theologian, but I did spend 16 years teaching law in universities. So I was a, a legal kind of academic. I was ultimately the um, kind of uh, deputy head of the faculty of law at the University of Birmingham. Um, and I think in some ways there are parallels between um, teaching law in a university and seminary training of people for ministry. Um, essentially, um, in, in the law faculty, we had 800-odd students, largely people who were training to be practitioners. And we were kind of um, academics doing research and teaching, but training practitioners. And the, the disconnect between academia and practice was very evident in that context. I think I noticed something over my 16 years of my academic career is it changed radically. When I first became a legal academic, it really was a focus on practical training for those who wanted to be lawyers. And research fitted within that framework. But there was then a very rapid and significant change in the understanding of what the academic role was, which was actually largely driven by kind of government funding of research. And approaches to research from the physical sciences and the social sciences were kind of suddenly brought into law. And what that did was it radically changed what people did and how they worked. So um, interestingly, rather than being interested in practicalities and practice, suddenly academic law seemed to be much more about philosophy, sociology, theory, critical theory. And, and at least from my perspective, it seemed as though it was a move to the, the, the sense that the more obscure something was, clearly the better it was. Mm -hmm. um, the way to get promoted was to be as obscure as possible. And almost certainly, if nobody else could understand what you were saying, that meant you were in some way elite. <laughs> and uh, what I saw is that kind of more and more of my colleagues were drawn into that. The way to be successful was to find some utterly obscure area, preferably a theory from somewhere else that nobody has applied to law before, and basically work out a way of saying how that's the most important thing that could be discovered. Now, you might think there are some parallels with that, with the way that theology works today. I couldn't possibly comment. Um, I also, in that environment, because I was both an academic and leading, a, helping to lead a department, I also engaged with something of the personality of the people who are engaged into academia. And there certainly was a personality type that was attracted to academia. In fact, in some ways, they were very often the opposite of the practical people who were going to go on and become lawyers. Uh, a sort of a, an interest in sort of very narrow, specific areas, a desire for debt. Some of my colleagues could never, ever reach to the point of completing any research because they were never, ever satisfied with how much they knew. Therefore, it never really produced anything that was really helpful to um, the wider community. Most academics I worked with had a deep sense of insecurity. At one level, they thought of themselves as hugely important, but they kind of doubted the world really believed that. 
And so they lived with an area of kind of intense insecurity, which meant that they spent their time trying to justify what they were doing as the most important thing. Again, I don't quite know whether that's true for you in your world of theology, but that was my experience in the um, kind of um, the academic uh, world. So I'm drawing a little bit on um, that um, sort of background as I, as I, in a sense, try to give you customer feedback from the pastor and the church um, end of things. Um, and I want to say, actually, my big thing is I really love you and value you. And I'm massively grateful for what you do and couldn't do my job without it. But at the same time, um, I, I want you to be able to work in a way that's most helpful um, to the churches, helpful to the leaders of uh, kind of churches. I think that's often about having a proper perspective on the task and how you do it. So this is customer feedback. One of the challenges here is um, kind of what is um, theology. Um, and, I, and although I've been asked to talk about kind of how theology should shape and ground the church, I think one of the challenges is that theology as we understand it today is just a multiplicity of different disciplines. It's not one single thing. It's a multiplicity of um, areas of research and work, um, a, a variety of different disciplines that fall under um, the label. And I want to say that um, those areas of theology are absolutely essential for the church um, at every level. In essence, they're about discovering the knowledge of God. Um, and there's a sense in which, in some way, every Christian, every pastor needs to be um, a theologian. And we urgently need the skills, um, the techniques that have been developed within these multiplicity of disciplines whether it be theology proper about the nature of God and who he is, biblical studies, understanding the, the documents that we have, whether it be the systematizing of theology and the developing of a clarity of um, a, a kind of propositions, biblical theology and the unfolding of the Bible story and how all the bits fit together, historical theology, discovering where we've come from and how we've got to where we are today. All those different things um, are kind of crucial and helpful for us um, in our understanding. Um, uh, and actually, part of the challenge is there's now just so many areas and so much material, it's difficult to keep up with it and keep a handle on it, um, I think is one of um, the significant challenges. But when I'm talking about theology, I guess I'm covering all of those different areas um, which contribute to our kind of knowledge of God and then ultimately to um, our ministry practice. Um, how does theology fit with the foundations of the church? I think the thing that I want to say here that I think seems to be significant is that theology as a discipline in and of itself is not the foundation of the church. I think there's a, a danger of thinking that theology is the foundation of the church as a, as a discipline, if I put it that way. Um, actually, that's the natural inclination of theologians to want to think that it is. We are the foundation of the church. It makes us crucial. And actually, I think a certain kind of evangelicalism can also fall into thinking theology is the foundation of the church. And I think one of the reasons for that is actually because we are intellectually insecure as Christians. In our culture and our context, we are intellectually insecure, and therefore, we kind of think that theology is the foundation of the church. Because theology brings a sort of respectability and in our culture, that's really important to us. And pastors and church members can fall into thinking that that is the case. So they look to you to be the foundation when maybe that's not what you're supposed to be. Um, I mean, my kind of evangelicalism, kind of a slightly more reformed kind of evangelicalism, I think, I think loves theology. It loves that intellectual respectability. I listen to a, a kind of a podcast regularly, the, the strap line of which I think is quite revealing. It always ends with kind of, you know, love God, enjoy him forever and read books. Mm -hmm. There's a certain section of evangelicalism that actually if you were to say from the outside, what does the Christian life really look like? Well, it's about collecting as many books and reading as many books as you possibly can. And that's a kind of a theology is the foundation kind of way of thinking. It seems to me that theology in and of itself is not the foundation, but it can help serve um, the foundation. So, so it's vitally important that we remember that actually in the church, it's Jesus Christ who's the foundation. He himself is the cornerstone. 
He's the one on whom the church is founded. He is the final and sufficient revelation of God. Um, and then very strangely, um, uh, in the New Testament, we read that it's actually the church that's the pillar and foundation of the truth. We write that in, in 1 Timothy. And I think that's actually quite a, a surprising verse. When you come to it, you read it and you think, that's not what I'm expecting it to say. What you expect it to say is the truth is the pillar and foundation of the church. And that's how we often think. But actually, it's the other way around. The church, the community of God's people, is the pillar and foundation of the truth. I think there's a really important interrelationship there between <coughs> truth and the community and how those two come together. It's quite important, I think, for the way that the work of theology at all its levels <coughs> fits in. It mustn't be out of the context of the church. It's actually done within the context of the church. The church is there to guard the truth. So there's actually this sort of symbiotic relationship between theologians and the church. You're to um, enable us to understand, but we're also to keep you in check, if that makes sense. There's a, a two-way relationship um, because the um, church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. And of course, ultimately, it's the scriptures that are the living and sufficient word of God, his um, uh, revelation uh, to us. Those, I think, are the, the fundamental foundations. Christ, um, the church, the scriptures. It seems to me the task and work of theology is to basically um, uh, support all of those, help us understand all of those, not to replace them in and of itself. So um, that's the, the foundation of the church, which then perhaps brings us to what I think is the importance of theology to the church as, as a discipline um, uh, and uh, how theologians serve the church. Now, um, here's a couple of analogies for you that I, I find helpful and how I perhaps see your work. I was once um, kind of visiting a church and one of the elders of the church was um, sort of worked for a big British defense company, the biggest British defense company and his job title was he was Director of Future Weapons Development. That was his job title. He was the Director of Future Weapons Development for this massive kind of defense industry. I had a fantastic time talking to him. He couldn't tell me about lots of things he was doing, but it was actually quite fun to kind of find out sort of some of what he was doing. And effectively, it was his job to do a number of things. It was his job to evaluate current equipment and whether it worked, whether it was effective, whether it was suitable to do the job. And then alongside that, it was his job to identify what he thought future threats would be that might come sort of the way. And then off that, to begin to think about what should we be developing now in order to enable us to be well prepared. Now, I don't think that's a particularly bad analogy for what theologians do. You kind of, um, in a sense, help us evaluate and understand where we are. You begin to anticipate threats that are coming over the horizon that may be more obvious to you than they are to us within the wider secular world, and in the academic world particularly. And then hopefully you're devising for us ways that we can counter those. I, th I think that's not a bad way of thinking about what I think theologians do that's massively helpful for us as a church. Um, or to put it another way, using a body analogy, it seems to me that um, in the perspective of the church, often you are kind of the brain thinking for us. We just need you to do all of that thinking because most of us haven't got the space, the time, and the energy to do it to the level that is needed. But you're able to do the thinking on our uh, kind of behalf. Or maybe if you put it in another way, and I once heard Don Carson describe himself in this way, you are the stomach of the church, in that you're kind of digesting it all for it, so that um, we can benefit from its nutrients. Um, or maybe another way of putting it is, is you are the nervous system. You are identifying the pains and the problems that ought to be warnings to us. I think those are just ways of describing kind of the function of theology and how it's a great help. 
to um, the church. Um, the, the challenge that fits with that is whether you then function effectively as the, of the mouths of the church that help us to understand that by articulating it to us. But we need the brain, we need the thinking, we need the digesting, we need the kind of nervous system warning, and then it needs to be able to be communicated to us. So I have this just, just two analogies that in some ways seems to me to capture the work that theologians do that is a huge benefit to um, the church. So um, maybe if I can describe this in a number of ways in which I think theology really serves us. They're, they're the things in some ways I really benefit from. So it's theology at a higher level than I'm capable of working at that helps us to understand God's revelation in Christ. So you help us to understand what kind of um, has been revealed to take it in. And that involves multiple levels. It involves engaging with the languages. It involves engaging with the culture. It involves um, developing and helping us to understand the terminology and the, the meaning. It involves scripture, the appreciation of genre and what significance that has. It's all the stuff that is distilled down into the kind of commentaries that we as pastors are reading to help us preach more effectively. And actually, whenever any of us preaches, we're already living off a wealth of work that's been done by others that we could never do for ourselves. And you've helped us to understand and to make judgments. I think that's some um, hugely um, helpful um, and valuable. I think as summarizing God's revelation for us in Christ, one of the challenges of kind of the Bible is you've basically got 66 books. And you know, at one level, it's not written in a, in a systematic way that kind of is, is the way that we've been trained to think. It requires being put together. And at one level, you can't even begin to put together until you've studied all of it and shaped it. Otherwise, you end up just kind of proof texting little bits here and there. That work of systematizing and bringing it together as a coherent whole is, again, massively important for us, I think, um, in the church. Those that do that well are just a wonderful resource. Um, I think defending God's revelation in Christ is, again, hugely significant. The work of kind of apologetics, I think there's, there's often a, an interface between apologetics and theology as to which drives the other. The church is often having to respond to the challenges of the culture, its intellectual environment, the arguments that it's making, the way that it's attacking the faith. And that requires response. And I think an awful lot of the work of theology is reactive and defensive in terms of seeking to re-articulate the faith in the light of those challenges that are raised. And again, that is just hugely helpful um, and because you're living in the intellectual world very often, you are often aware of those trends and dangers way ahead of when we are, way ahead of when they hit the church um, and the pew. And to have done that work of thinking, to have helped us understand what the challenge is and how to respond to it is just immensely um, sort of beneficial to the church as a whole. Most of us simply don't have the time to keep up um, with what's happening, or to think through how to respond to it. Um, and it needs those who can. So I mean, I, I, by way of an example, I remember this is years ago now, it's probably all old hat. When, when the whole kind of postmodern deconstructionist theory was beginning to hit, it actually had required people who'd engaged with that, thought about it, understood it, could tell us what was happening, and tell us how to respond. And that was just hugely helpful. Um, and most of us in ministry, we just don't have the ability to do that or the time to do it. And it's vital that there are those who do it well for us. Uh, and then I think applying God's revelation in Christ, helping us to think about what does this actually mean for here and now? What are its practical outworkings? And you might think that actually that's the job of pastors, that's the job of Christians to work that through, but actually we often require help with that because it requires reading the culture. <laughs> 
and taking the principles and working them into kind of the present context. So I, I think those are the kinds of things that theologians do that are absolutely crucial and that the church massively benefits from. And in honesty, I think we often take for granted and just assume it will happen. We kind of like the end product of what you do and probably don't give you enough credit for the work that's been done for it. We like the fact that we can walk into the bookstore and buy a whole load of resources that will help us. And we don't often think too much about what's been needed behind that in order for resources of those quality to be produced. So I think those are the things that we massively benefit. So just some areas that uh, kind of strike me where it's been really helpful to me, the work that's been being done, um, the help that I'm gaining, things that we've had to navigate, either are navigating or, or, or kind of have sort of navigated in, in, in the past few kind of maybe decades. Um, I think the work of theologians, the whole area of the doctrine of God has been significantly contested and raised um, in the rec recent period. I mean, again, most of us who are ordinary pastors and leaders just can't engage with that to any depth. And we're dependent upon trusted others to do the work of research, to go back and look at what the church fathers have said, to work through what the creeds and the confessions say, to think about how that's being kind of developed by theologians today, to kind of help us to understand what the debates are, why they matter, and where we ought to land on them. And actually, the reality is that pastors and leaders don't make independent judgments on that. They, they kind of listen to trusted voices. What, what we as pastors and leaders are able to do, we're actually quite good probably at weighing between good and bad arguments. So actually, when theologians present us with arguments, we're actually quite good at saying that's a good argument, that's a bad argument. We can judge between arguments but it kind of needs to have got to a certain level before we, before we can do that. Um, so that's a, a kind of an area. I think the whole justification debate has been a really big thing that's been in the background. There's a classic example of uh, sort of redefinitions, kind of revisions, uh, people coming from almost within the camp saying you've completely misunderstood something, We've now got to completely change. And um, as ever, something new and novel grabs loads of attention and everybody thinks that's really exciting. And maybe what we've discovered fits with what we wanted to be the case all along. And then it needs people to help us to navigate that and kind of um, understand it. I think actually some of the social issues that we're facing at the moment, um, actually issues like race, gender issues, um, actually they are deeply theological issues. There's a danger of simply leaving them to kind of the sociologists and the theorists. Actually, what we need to be able to engage with those is the theological resources to think about how does God's revelation speak into these situations. So what's happening philosophically? What's happening sociologically in the world? How does the Bible, how does God's revelation relate to that? And actually, that's a deeply theological task. And I think if the theological part of that is missing, basically pastors and leaders and congregations will get it wrong. Um, and you know, obviously, perennial question of biblical authority. How do we sort of think about scripture? Do we have confidence in it? Um, that, that's an ever ongoing um, area in which um, uh, kind of we need uh, sort of help. So essentially, we need your expertise and we need your time in order to be able to navigate those challenges. Um, and in that way, you are hugely helpful to um, the church. So it's not that theology is so much the foundation of the church and that theologians are necessarily the most important people in the church, but that work is crucial to clarity about what those foundations are and making sure that they continue to have their place. So that's the um, uh, importance of um, theology um, to uh, the church. It's why we love you. Um, what are the dangers of theology to the church? We talked a little bit about um, what the um, sort of um, importance of the uh, theology is to the church. But what about, what about the dangers um, of um, theology uh, to um, the church? Uh, and I think that the danger here is that if theology gets out of balance... 
and loses the role and the place that it has, all of those positive benefits can be lost and obscured. The danger is kind of, um, in a sense, theology can become a danger um, if it loses sight of its place um, and um, its purpose. So I, th I think some of the uh, kind of the dangers within theology, the, the things that we can fall into, is there is a danger within theology of the attraction of the novel and an always looking for novelty. And at one level, I understand that. But the, the, a creation of constant novelty is a potential danger um, within theology. And both theologians and then by sort of derivatively pastors and churches can be easily taken in by the lure of the novel. As if somehow that is more authentic, more true, more real, fresh. So I think that the constant generation of the novel is a, is a, is a, is a potential challenge. Um, we'll think why that, why that might be in a moment. Um, uh, equally, I think there's the danger of the obscure and making the um, obscure seem to be sort of central. Um, and that can also be um, distorting. And I think the, um, the reason why these are potentially dangerous is because of their impact on the priorities um, kind of of, of the church. So some of the particular ways that theology can be dangerous is that, it, that its impact can be to undermine confidence in the truth of God's revelation. I know theologians don't intend to do that, but its effect can be to undermine confidence in the truth of God's revelation. And that's because I think often the natural temptation of theologians is to say that everything is more complex than you think it is. Theologians are identifiers of complexity and questions and uncertainty. Now, there's a legitimate place for that. But you can enter into a mindset in which everything is made so much more complex and so much more qualified that you end up asking, can anybody ever be certain about anything? Even at the levels of high levels of probability of certainty. And I think that levels of complexity that make things more problematic and more difficult actually causes church leaders and Christians to throw their hands up in the air and say, I can't know anything. I think that that is a danger, I think, in the way that theology can work. And you, you've got to be, have a certain level of discernment to be able to not be taken in by that and not be phased by it. So I think there's that danger of undermining confidence by making things more complex. Um, a second element of that is actually potentially undermining confidence in, in actually the accessibility of God's revelation. In other words, can ordinary pastors and can ordinary church people really understand what God is saying? And I think that the challenge there is that the theologian can think you've so got to get behind the language of Scripture to something more technical, more precise, that in the end it disempowers the language of Scripture to be capable of making God known. So that the technical language and the technical discourse ends up being seen as superior. I, I think it's a natural thing that kind of um, academics, professionals, T tend to want to gravitate towards language which is more abstract, abstract and more technical. Whereas actually one of the interesting things about God's revelation is how it's incredibly concrete in, in the way that it works. And it works primarily through kind of metaphors and pictures, which are quite, quite concrete and accessible. So it, it can have the effect of giving a whole other language which to many ordinary pastors and Christians is in fact impenetrable because it's a language of expertise. And if that is seen as being superior, actually it, uh, it unintentionally undermines the ability to engage with uh, kind of God's word. Um, now this is not true, but a parallel with that is that 
the problem of the person in your Bible study who has the study Bible with them. And basically, they can't engage with the text because the only thing they really want to read are the notes. Does that make sense? So they've lost their kind of the Bible having its place, and it's become the notes that have become their real authority. And in a derivative sense, I think that we can accidentally create that. Um, now, um, in, in some ways, um, you might say both of those are undermining of key evangelical convictions. Um, they're, they're, in a sense, a, a kind of an undermining of the, the, the kind of um, the truth of God's revelation and an undermining of what you might call the perspicuity of Scripture. In other words, that Scripture is clear enough in itself for people to know God and experience salvation. And we can just inadvertently um, undermine um, that. Um, uh, uh, sort of, I, I think um, uh, in relation to um, uh, well, Pip, uh, a, a, a third kind of danger there is I think sometimes theology can have the effect of distorting the coherence of God's revelation. And what I mean by that is because of there are all such different theological disciplines, to be an expert in the end, you have to be an expert in a tiny area. Most people cannot be expert today across the whole. So you think about what most PhDs are. Most PhDs are in something tiny and small. And uh, the problem with that is that lots of theologians become highly specialized in one tiny thing. But the danger with that is that tiny thing is not necessarily held in balance with everything else because it becomes so narrowly focused. And inevitably, people think that their tiny thing, because it's their thing, is the most important thing. So I think what happens is, is you, you end up losing coherence of how all the parts fit together. And what that leads to then often, I think, is an imbalance in the priorities of God's revelation. You can end up actually um, sort of creating a sort of an artificial priority and um, I think that arises just because by nature we want to make the thing that we're interested in or the thing that we know about the most important thing. So we actually impose a priority that comes from our interests rather than letting kind of the revelation as a whole set the, um, uh, the priorities. So, and I think there there's a, there's a real balance of how to integrate what might rightly be your interests and your expertise with the needs of the church, and the people of God as a whole. You have to, in a sense, have both of those horizons, I think, kind of in view as to how your work fits in. So um, some uh, just examples of that. I think, I, again, the use of uh, one of the ways that this might happen is by uh, kind of falling into thinking that the technical and philosophical language of theology is somehow more ultimate more accurate, more precise, more true. I've been reading something recently that I, I found quite helpful that's been dealing with kind of the use of philosophical language and terminology in theology that's wanted to argue that we shouldn't deceive ourselves that it's any less analogical than ordinary human language. I think that's quite helpful as a perspective. There is this tendency to think that when I move into the realm of philosophical terminology, I've come, somehow come closer to reality and there's a kind of a hidden analogy in humanness, even to the language that's used there. But we can kind of create that impression, which then forces you into having to acquire a language um, and a different structure. Um, obviously, pride of academic expertise is um, a, a kind of an area that um, we all um, suffer from and, and struggle with. Again, it's the idea that, that, that our bit that we've devoted hours and hours and hours of time and vast amounts of kind of seminary education, post degrees, money, et cetera, that that is um, important and central. We talked a little bit about the narrowness um, of knowledge um, in um, a specific area. Um, and so I think those are potential ways in which theology, even though it sets out to be helpful and empowering to the church, can actually end up being disempowering and counterproductive. 
<coughs> and I think it's just important that we recognize sort of um, uh, that. Um, and actually, for those who are at the level of pastors and kind of church members, the problem is they haven't got the whole framework of your kind of professional expertise to put in perspective what it is that you might be saying. I think once you get sort of beyond a level, you're into that realm of a little bit of knowledge is dangerous. <laughs> and you might not intend things to lead to some of those distorting consequences, but when they're picked up by pastors or when they're picked up by kind of church members who are listening to you, they can easily have that um, effect. So um, I guess the, the practicality that then flows out of that is how can you do theology well in a way that serves the church? How can you serve the church? As I said, we, we love you and we want to value and benefit from sort of what you do. So these are just some of my kind of thoughts of the things that I, I kind of really appreciate as you think about um, how you um, serve the church. And I'm sure these are challenges that you face um, in your roles. Uh, so I think the first challenge is, is to think through who is your audience? Who are you working for and who are you communicating with? And I suspect that like people in multiple areas who are kind of at the intellectual and academic top of an entire kind of system, it means you inevitably are speaking to different audiences. They're not all the same. And one of the skills, I think, is to be able to speak to those different audiences in an appropriate way. And you don't necessarily speak to everybody in the same way. And maintaining something of those boundaries seems to me to be um, really helpful. This is really all about how we work as servants and thinking about how we communicate to the group that we're communicating to. So at one level, there's a different sort of importance in the way that we communicate if you're seeking to communicate to the secular academy, where obviously you're seeking to establish the credibility of the Christian faith, the gospel, where there's a, a need to gain a certain level of professional respect in order to be heard. That's kind of inevitable, given the nature of um, the secular academy. Then there's um, perhaps professional theologians who are kind of within the church, Christians, evangelicals. The way you might speak to evangelical theologians who share certain of your presuppositions might be different to the way that you speak in the secular academy. Those two groups might actually value different things and respect different things. And then you come down to the level at which you're sort of speaking to per church leaders. Um, uh, uh, who don't have your technical expertise. And then um, even below that, the kind of the congregation uh, kind of members. And I think it's about being mindful in each of those groups, what is going to be most helpful to that group and what it is you're seeking to um, achieve within it. And so a, 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 a kind of a sophistication of communication at those different levels is vital. Now, from my church leader perspective, um, I think it's the point at which you come down to the church leader and the congregation member level that you need to just remember who it is you're speaking to and think about what will help them, what will um, bring clarity as opposed to what might bring confusion, um, and to work really hard um, on that. Um, but, but as I think about all of those different levels in which we might engage, it seems to me that something is absolutely fundamental is that we have integrity across all of them. We might communicate differently, but we're actually not fundamentally saying different things to different audiences. But there is a, an integrity of our communication. So the communication is different because of the audience we're speaking to, but in a sense, there's an integrity of what is being said. We don't, we don't say what pleases the particular group but we might say what we're saying in a different way because of it. That's, you'll think that's just blindingly obvious. Um, I think um, in terms of how you serve the church as part of this, actually something that is really prized is kind of simplicity and clarity. What church leaders and particularly church members needs is simplicity and clarity. And what I don't mean by that is simplification. 
I, I actually think that saying something simply and clearly is actually a really high level skill that actually requires you to have sort of done really deep work to be able to do that. I, I actually find even as a pastor and a preacher, I find crystallizing things clearly and simply in a way that utterly resonates with the text, the most difficult thing. And it actually requires the most work. Actually, I can get away with waffling around a text with all sorts of things I can bring into it and talk about and be interested in that don't bring clarity, but that basically look quite clever. And actually, it, that doesn't require anywhere near as much work as kind of trying to reach the point of a simplicity and clarity that so obviously captures what it's about. I think what's most helpful to the church is when theologians have done so much work, they can reach that point of simplicity and clarity for the church. So that when we, on the receiving end, read or hear, we just think, yes, that's absolutely it. You've clarified it for me with a precision that I can understand that is obviously right. Um, that's what's hugely helpful for it. And it may well be you have to justify that in all sorts of technical ways to higher level audiences, but that clarity at the end of the process is just what brilliantly helps us uh, kind of in, in, the, in the church. Now, that might affect kind of, in a sense, the questions of what you write, who you write it for, what level um, you write it um, sort of for. I think one of the challenges in, in kind of theology in, in both our research and our, our writing is always to be asking the question, um, given what I'm kind of doing, uh, given what I'm thinking of writing about, um, is it needed and who's it for? Are good questions to ask. Is it needed, who's it for? Um, and there are various kind of temptations there. It might actually primarily be for me and says, I enjoy it, I like it, I'm doing this actually because it's of interest to me. Um, it might be for because it's what the publisher wants. Actually, generally, they're the primary person I'm seeking to please. But it's just worth thinking about who is it that I'm actually doing this for and locating that in, in, in the right place. Um, I think one of the things that is a challenge within evangelicalism at the moment is the sheer plethora of things being produced that are basically the same. <laughs> um, and I'm, I, you know, there must be immense pressure on people to kind of produce basically resources that are near identical to resources that are already there. The challenge when you do that is you, you are under pressure to basically either do it in a novel way or add something different. Nobody ever basically writes something saying, I'm writing this because basically I've been asked to and I know it's not much different to all of what's there already, but I, I need to write it. But if you're preaching a sermon and you read five modern commentaries on a book, you end up discovering they're all pretty much the same in reality, an awful lot of, lot of overlap. So there's an awful lot of energy going into the production of things that already exist. Um, I think that's just worth... Uh, kind of bearing in mind. Is it needed? Who's it for? That's really how it's going to serve. Um, maybe for, for theologians, this is a question worth thinking about. Where is your accountability? Who are you accountable to as those who are doing this work of academic theology? Now, for most of us, that will work at multiple levels, and it might depend on the role we have, how we're funded, our professional position. But some there's almost certainly an accountability to an institution that you work for, an academic body that employs you that has certain standards and certain expectations. There might be a sense in which you're kind of accountable in a more informal way to the guild of professional theologians, the kind of peer group who relates to your work. Um, but I think it's also important for theologians if they're not to become disconnected, to at least maintain a sense of accountability to the church more broadly and to the local church. So there is not a, a, an in, a, a kind of a, an opening up of a gap. At its simplest, 
I think that means that theologians need to make sure they're members of local churches under the discipline of the local church. And that there isn't this sense that somehow the academy and the church are separate spheres. I think it's absolutely vital that theologians are functioning members of local churches under the authority of those local churches. And that they don't assume that in the local church that they therefore are automatically the one with teaching authority. That actually that under the teaching authority of, of the church, that kind of structure. So don't allow a disconnect to create between the work of theology, the work in the seminary, and the kind of the local uh, kind of church. Uh, it becomes that sort of disconnected. So at a level of personal discipleship, a level of the truth that you're teaching, um, uh, I, I think that's vital. So um, to sum it all up, um, I, I think it's just vital that you keep on asking, how are you serving the body? <coughs> how are you serving the body of Christ. Um, and actually, God has gifted you with remarkable abilities, intellect, ability to be able to assess. You've been trained in those professional skills in a way that kind of most kind of haven't. In a sense, most people who end up in that work of theology, they've kind of gone through a whole process. They haven't got there just because they woke up one day and decided, I'm going to make myself a theologian. They've, they've been through a whole process of training and testing, and not everybody got to that point because not everybody had those gifts and those skills. So it's a, a remarkable kind of gifting that has enabled people to get there. But how is that gifting used? And I think the pattern there is, as in every area of life, the pattern of the Lord Jesus. And it's the Ephesians kind of model of he was equal with God, yet was willing to put that aside to become a servant for the sake of others. I think I just encourage theologians who are working to serve the church to sort of constantly thinking about that model of kind of service. It's not that Jesus ceased to be equal with God, but he used it in the service of um, those that he came to save. Not, it's not quite a, a kind of a denial of who he is. But the whole idea of humility, this idea of considering others better than yourselves, it's not about pretending that you're not what you are, but it's about using what you are to be of benefit to other people. And, and I think that's a great model for thinking through the role of theology, that it's not about denying the gifts and the expertise that, that we might have, the ability to be able to understand things, um, read things, engage with things that the rest of the church ordinary church leaders and members will never be able to do. But it's about using that in the service of kind of the body. So I think it's probably a helpful discipline to always be asking the question, how is what I'm doing serving and helping church leaders and church members? To so make sure that that's a, an important aspect of up where we're at. And I think in some ways, I'm actually quite interested, I think Pete in his kind of Bible readings here, has been absolutely showing us that. Here's somebody with absolute depth of knowledge that is quite extraordinary of biblical languages, biblical documents, kind of how bits of the Bible fit together. I've learned so much just through those little kind of um, sermons. But yet, in the end, that has totally served the church in the way that that has been communicated. And I think, I think that's been a, a kind of a good model for us of expertise that are used in service. And in some ways, I think it's probably the unfortunate destiny of theologians that you're kind of like icebergs. Not in the sense that you're cold fish or something like that, <laughs> but that actually um, uh, the stuff that really benefits the church is just like the tent that pokes above the water. And that's only possible because of the nine tenths that's underneath. And the nine tenths is crucial for the bit that kind of pokes above the water. And in a way, humility accepts that there's that whole load that most people will never know, never appreciate. But at one level, um, it's important because it's enabled the tenth to be done. And I think it's living happily um, with that. If I can add one final thing. 
um, uh, in terms of theology and how it serves the church. Um, just two contrasts of maybe what I, in the end I'm hoping to sort of encourage you to, to articulate. Um, in the recent period, I've been trying to read some Aquinas. I'm sorry, I find it impenetrable. I find it immensely hard going. I haven't really been edified by it. He clearly wasn't writing for me. <laughs> um, in contrast, I quite love reading Calvin because he's clearly writing for the church and for pastors. And I actually think the depth of his learning is probably not less. He's engaged with a lot of the same stuff. But the way he's chosen to write it is infinitely more accessible. I guess that's what I'm looking for in theologians who serve the church.